Good afternoon. It's wonderful to be here. So I'm Indrapal Vandari. I'm the Global Chief Data Officer of IBM. I've actually done, the, done this job four times now. So when I started out in 2006 as a Chief Data Officer of a healthcare enterprise, there were only four of us globally with that title. And now, of course, there are literally thousands and thousands of us. And there are these, these other positions that are related, like Chief Analytics Officer, Transformation Officer, Digital Officer. These were all proliferating after that time. So I had the fortune of uh, being there at the right time. And I continued with the profession. And I grew with it. And I think of the original four, I'm the last one standing still doing this job, which I don't know if it's good or bad, but it, it certainly allowed me to make a craft of it. So I know exactly what I'm going to do day one, stepping into a company, six months, 12 months, 24 months. So it has allowed me to do that. So I'm going to leverage some of that experience. I'm also going to leverage the experience that we've had at IBM in terms of transforming the company using data and AI. And I'll also draw on some general concepts because uh, you know, AI is such an important topic of our times. I think it's extremely relevant. We need to understand it. We need to direct it. We need to leverage it, etc. So with that as the backdrop, let me give you a few facts and figures. So, Pre-pandemic, when we talked with CEOs, there was a small percentage of them that used to think that digital transformation was important. Then the pandemic hit, and over the course of about a year, we saw, this is as IBM, you know, our customers, the interest, the awareness at the CEO level was just, it went through the roof. And we've probably had as much digitization in the last year, year and a half, as we did in the previous 10 years. Mainly because people realized that there is no option. We, we have to do this. And it's not just for engaging with our clients, but also our employees. Because employees also started viewing the world very differently. So that was the great digital shift. Now, one other thing that became evident as these enterprises started down that path was they began to realize that the digitized version of their business was more resilient, more scalable. Just in many ways, it had some tremendous advantages that the previous approaches did not. And that began to make them think about, maybe we ought to reinvent businesses. Maybe we, we ought to invent new businesses. And about 55% of the CEOs we talk with say that by 2026, you know, there's a large percentage of their, over, well over 50% of their business will be new products that they don't actually have uh, today. But that's because they've developed an appreciation of what digital transformation actually is able to do and the advantages and the benefits thereof, and then think about extending it to their own business because they have to be forward thinking, right? That's the nature of the, of the beast. You've got to be competitive. And if you're left behind, then it's not going to be good. So the whole, what we see now is this whole emphasis on reinvention of the business, primarily, obviously, using technology. So which has also then led CEOs to understand that technological eminence is going to be extremely important to the extent that you can align technology with your business and your digitization approaches, it's going to afford you tremendous advantages. And in the studies that we've done, it's got to do with you know, client centricity, uh, employee experience, automation of uh, not just AI, but business processes, and some core things like that that'll take the business to the next level. All right. So I said I'm going to say a few things about AI before we actually get into what we did at IBM. And this is going to be at a general level. I'm not going to get technical or geeky on this. I think it's extremely important for people to understand at a gut level what these systems are about. So 
At IBM, we like to refer to them as augmented intelligence systems. And I'll explain why that is. It's basically, there's going to be a decision maker in the loop, and these systems have to work with that decision maker. The decision maker is going to be human, for the most part. There are examples, you know, like uh, algorithmic trading and things like that, where, yeah, it's going to be totally automated. But for the most part, you will have a human in the loop. And uh, if you keep that in the back of your minds as we go through the rest of this description, it'll all begin to make, uh, make sense. So first attribute that these systems must have is expertise. They have to be expert at something. It could be you know, a particular discipline like uh, medical science. It could be a process like supply chain. It could be a whole domain like banking. But the system's got to be an expert at something. That's the first E. I use the four E's to describe them. The second E is expression. They've got to be able to express themselves naturally. What do I mean by that? So that the human decision maker can actually understand what the, what, what the, what the system is recommending. So I'll give you an example. This is my second go around at IBM. First go around nearly two decades ago, in fact, over two decades ago, I was part of their research center, the IBM Watson Research Center. And I ended up creating this computer program that was used by every team in the National Basketball Association in the US. And this, the teams would use this program to surface hidden patterns in data from game data. So they could actually plan out their, their lineups and their strategies for the playoff games. The playoff games are the knockout, knockout stage of the, of the sport. And I remember very clearly the first time there was a really counterintuitive pattern that was found by the system. It essentially came back and told the coach, you, they were down 2-0. They had lost two games. They had been blown out of two games. Uh, they, they, they came back and told the coach that you should play your backup point guard and your backup forward in your starting lineup. Now, that's like saying, you know, play, play your tail enders instead of your openers. Have the tail enders open up the innings versus your openers. Or, you know, don't start your star striker in soccer. Uh, you know, put in some backup player to start. And the coach calls me and says, you realize if I do this and we lose the game, not only will I lose the series, I'll lose my job. I'll probably lose my career because everybody will think like I'm a total, you know, just I don't know what I'm doing. And it hit me that with these systems, which essentially surface counterintuitive things, which infer things, they've got to be able to explain what it's about. Otherwise, you have that reaction, right? Think of a medical system that tells the surgeon, amputate the left leg. The surgeon's not going to do that. He's going to say, why? You know, what other options did you consider? How did you arrive at that reasoning? They've got to be able to explain it. So natural expression for these types of system is critical. Just to give you an idea, I mean, the way we, we solved that problem then was we showed the coach the video clips of the two games they had lost when those players were on the floor, the, you know, their starting players. And then they realized, yeah, this is a really good idea about replacing them because these backup players do very well under those circumstances. They could see it, but that kind of that context was missing in those old data mining programs. Today's AI systems actually do a much better job of integrating context because they're able to not just process structured data, but also unstructured data like video, audio, scene composition, et cetera. 30, education. So these systems are not programmed in the conventional sense. Yeah, somebody programs them somewhere, but when you're working with them, you don't write you know, rules in code. You don't even write business rules using some interface. You teach them by showing them data. So they learn as we learn. It's basically about data and edge use cases, and you know, then they kind of begin to understand what to do. And so they are educated in that fashion. Last E is evolve. They're able to do all that and essentially learn from it, go to the next level. So handle lots and lots of data, and then essentially learn from it so that they can execute on it. 
And the reason it's so important, because it's going to hit everybody in every profession, no matter where you are. So we've got people who are at entry level jobs, essentially have to deal with AI uh, systems. I'll give you one example. One of the things, this happens in my area, that we do is we try to determine if uh, the company we are dealing with is a government owned entity. And you, know, you might think that should be pretty simple. It's either owned by the government or not. But it's actually very subtle because in many cases, you know, it looks like it's not, but potentially is. So, and, and today's systems are able to understand that. And they, you know, they can kind of surf through the internet, see whatever publicly available information is, you know, is there in close to real time, and find out things like the founder of this company was just appointed to a very high-ranking government committee. You know, may or may not say that they are government-owned, but it becomes relevant, and then you know, the person who's making that determination has a much better discussion with our lawyers and our salespeople in terms of finally arriving at a judgment, which is right, right? That's, it's very important for us. As a global company, we want to be ethical and deal with, uh, in each country, exactly what the laws say. And the laws are very different for government-owned entities, but that's an entry-level position. So I would submit pretty much everybody's job is going to, at some point, you know, be, be changed by this. And that's exactly why I think it's extremely important. One of the other things we learned. So in 2011, we had a, an AI program that won the Jeopardy competition in the US, right? This is the, the Q&A uh, competition, the quiz competition, and it won it. And in the uh, 1990s, somewhere there, we actually had a computer program that beat uh, Kasparov, who was the chess champion at that time. So the question is, what were we doing since then? Well, we kind of realized, again, with these systems, there are certain things that are extremely important, perhaps more important than the algorithms, if you're going to, be, if, if you're going to do this stuff in a socially responsible kind of way. So what are those things? One is transparency. Because if you think about it, you know, when a system like this is working in a, for a particular company, sitting in a business process, it learns the intellectual property of the company. That's what it's picking up. So the executives of the company have to be very confident that whoever is the vendor, the maker of the system, is not going to disintermediate them. So the transparency has to be exceptional. I talked about explainability already, why that's important. Robustness. These systems are also pretty fragile. They're very smart, but they can be very fragile. So you've heard the examples of you know, the self-driving car essentially gets fooled by a full moon thinking it's a stop sign. Well, it, it just depends on how these systems are trained. So you could have an adversary shows them examples and uh, edge cases that are misleading, and they can kind of be misled. So they have to be robust. The robustness has to actually permeate all the way from the data, so that the quality of the data that's being used to, the, to, to train these systems has to be robust. The pipelines that are used to, these systems run thousands and thousands of experiments, so you kind of have to have these pipelines to set this stuff up so that they can actually be streamlined and do things in a reasonable amount of time. So all that stuff has to be robust. The last two are actually even more interesting, right? When it comes to dealing with data about people, there has to be a level of fairness that's got to be baked into these systems. So think of it this way. Let's say there's a large retail organization hiring thousands and thousands of employees, and they're using AI in their HR uh, hiring process. If there is a bias in that program, the decisions are going to be you know, tuned to that bias. And if it surfaces at some point, then essentially, the, not only is that program ruined, but the company suffers tremendous reputational damage and so forth. So extremely important, I think from a, even from a competitive standpoint, I think all this stuff will become a differentiation, right, for a company that adheres to this versus one that does not. So fairness is extremely important. The other thing, when using data about people, the privacy has to be of utmost importance. Now, why do I say that? Because these systems, infer stuff. So it's not like you look at the data that's there and you look at it and you say, oh yeah, I can see this. This is you know, somebody's name, address, birth date. You know, you've got to be kept private. Since these systems infer things, so there was an example, infamous example, about a large retail organization 
in the US that started sending uh, essentially pregnancy related information to a household. And the dad was extremely upset, addressed to his daughter, 16 years old. And it turned out that they were looking at data about shopping patterns. So not private, you know, from a privacy standpoint, nothing really that would be flagged, you know, but with the health rules for privacy. But they were able to infer that the lady was pregnant, totally violating her privacy, right? So you, you've got to, for the privacy for, this, for these systems has to be, again, at, another, at a different level. So those attributes that you see there on the right, extremely important to be baked in with these systems. I, I think not just for you know, the right societal impact, but also for the competitiveness of these companies, because eventually companies that don't have this baked in are not going to succeed. I mean, that's my opinion, that's our opinion. I think that's of utmost importance. So we've kind of taken a platform approach. We knew the algorithmic stuff, but now you know, it, we, we've kind of recognized that all these other things are extremely important, must be part of the platform that you bring to the table when you're dealing with these systems. Let me switch back to my experience at IBM now. So the first thing I do when I walk in is I create a data strategy. And there are five steps that I go through as part of the craft. I'm only going to cover the first one here, but you're welcome to contact me later and we'll talk about the others. So data strategy essentially is to enable whatever business strategy the company is following. So in IBM's case, I determined that the business strategy was cloud and AI. They wanted to make money selling cloud and AI systems. Now we sold, you know, we made a lot of money selling mainframes and middleware and all that kind of stuff, but every senior executive was clear. Going forward, the company is going to make money through cloud and AI. And that raised the question, well, what does AI really mean for an enterprise? It was clear what it meant for a consumer because of the likes of Google and Amazon and so forth, but for an enterprise, what does it mean? And we recognized that we didn't really have a good answer to that question. So I proposed that our data strategy should be to make IBM itself into an AI enterprise, thereby understanding what that's all about. And that will then allow us to move forward with our clients and customers who look a lot like us. So that's, that became our data strategy, and then that kind of told us what data to govern. So for instance, if it's, if you're, if you're going to, if it's about AI, it's not just structured data, we also have to govern unstructured data. So that's why there's a little bit of a sequence there. And we kind of move forward with developing an AI enterprise within IBM itself. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we learned. So one major lesson that came out of that was it wasn't just about data, wasn't just about technology. Those two are kind of obvious when you do something like this, you know. But it was also as much about process because we learned that what AI means to an enterprise is that you have to infuse it into every major business process, whether it be supply chain or procurement or marketing or my area and data, you know, as the example I gave you, uh, it's, it's got to be a part of the process. And then finally, the people aspect, the culture aspect is perhaps even more important. If you have somebody doing a job, right, just go back to my simple example about that uh, government owned entity. If the analyst that's doing the job is uncomfortable dealing with an AI system that's making these recommendations and justifying it and so forth. If they don't understand it, they're not going to be able to do the job. So then it behooves us that people are retrained, they, you know, they understand what AI is about, and uh, then they're able to actually have the right mindset as well as the organization has the right culture to be able to do this. I would tell you that the easier parts of the puzzle are data and tech. The much harder parts of the puzzle are the process and the people. So that's kind of why I try to stress that. And I will also say that they have to move in lockstep. If you go too far ahead with one or the other, uh, everything stalls until the other dimensions catch up. So that was one you know, major lesson I wanted to find out. I'll give you a few, few examples of what we ended up finding when we were able to infuse AI into every major business process. We found out what the major outcome is. The major outcome across the enterprise is you end up decreasing the end-to-end -end cycle time across these major processes in very dramatic ways. 
on average 70%. So there are huge gains to be had by getting this done. And uh, you, know, you can see we've got, got this implemented in all kinds of different processes spanning marketing, sales, finance, and operations. And you, you, get, you get a sense of what the, what the value is as well as how you go about it doing that in an enterprise. Um, some other lessons to the point I made earlier, uh, earlier, infused in every business process means everyone's going to want to use these systems. It won't just be the data scientists and the nerdy types and the geeky types. It's going to be your salespeople, your marketing people, your frontline people. They'll all want to be able to use these systems because they all see the value for the, for the insights. So you have to design with that in mind. So that's one major aspect of this as well. Uh, also, a little bit about, if you look at the benefits, you'll also get a sense of why this, is, uh, this becomes important. So why you need these systems, why in fact it's almost inevitable. So I'll make a few comments about that. So we see a lot of value, well, you know, we've seen a lot of value on the governance side regulations, so forth, multi-cloud integration, the ops, you know, just intelligently automating the ops, and then uh, the, the customer experience and the employee experience. But I'll, I'll give you some, some, some sense of why this is in today's world. So most large enterprises will make use of multiple clouds. I think we make use of nine, to, nine clouds, maybe it may be more, but at least nine clouds. Most enterprises are like that. They will make use of that many clouds. Then they're going to be, so within this are, you know, public clouds, private clouds. There'll also be on-prem locations. There'll be certain, uh, certain you know, uh, locations that are legacy, which you haven't been able to change. The drivers for all this are twofold. One is workflow. Certain workflow is so critical, you don't want to put it on the public cloud for some reason, you're nervous about it, you're gonna keep it very close to the chest. The other is regulation. What you can do in Singapore, you can't do in Germany. You know, countries have different regulations about data. They're getting more and more strict about it. It all started with the European Union GDPR regulation, but it's kind of, you know, now it's, it's proliferating across the world. And so that's, that, that's kind of why you see this aspect of you're going to be dealing with a world where the data is going to be distributed, you're going to have to play it as it lies, as they say in golf, and uh, you're, you're also going to have to do things appropriately, so it can't just be one size fits all, because the regulations are different, right? So it's got to be a consistent framework, but it should allow you for different policies for different places. And then the, the operational aspects, as you can imagine, if you're dealing with that kind of environment, extremely complex. You know, so enterprises are going to struggle to do this. So that's the major opportunity from an enterprise standpoint. And from our experience, again, I mean, now it looks pretty pat and you know, we've got a good message and all that, but it took us six, seven years to arrive at this with lots of uh, pain points and struggles and hiccups and you know, failures of all kinds, but we kind of understand now where things are and why they need to be the way they have to be. So, distributed environment across multiple clouds. How are you going to solve that? You want to make sure there's portability across these clouds. So you write once, you can run anywhere, and that's kind of why we acquired Red Hat. They had this, uh, th this product called OpenShift, and we used that as the layer, and we thought, well, maybe that's, that's enough. That's going to be game over with that. Then we kind of realized with all these regulations, can't do you know, what's appropriate in Germany, different from Singapore, et cetera. You're, going to f you're forced to leave the data where it lies. Things become a lot more complicated. So the idea that we had was of the data fabric, which is kind of a concept that you, you hear about a lot now. I'm, I'm going to give you some, uh, you, know, you have access to the slide anyway, but I'm going to give you again my sense of what it is. So, there are a few components that go into a data fabric. It's all about having, think of it conceptually anyway, single pane of glass to help you manage this very complicated environment, distributed environment, that you, know, you have to, you, you pretty much have to do that because of all the meta conditions that are surrounding you. So you need the single pane of glass. There are certain components that make that possible. One we call an augmented knowledge graph. 
think of that as the next evolution of metadata. Metadata was data about data, so you kind of know, you know what data you have, where it is. So the augmented knowledge graph gives you that information as well as who can access it, what are the kinds of policies that need to be in play, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one. Once you have that metadata, then you can do automation intelligently. So that's the next piece, intelligent automation. You have to have support for that. And so this goes far beyond the usual stuff about you know, having different integration patterns and all that stuff for data. But you've got to be able to auto, you know, automate intelligently the entire process so that it becomes much simpler to manage something like this. Self-service is another huge example. Because you're forced to operate in many different countries, many different environments, leave the data there, you can't really have a situation where you know, it's not going to be centralized. You want people, especially the consumers, you know, outside of the, of, the, of the nerds and the geeks and the data scientists, everybody else, they've got to be able to self-serve. So this is where, if you hear another concept of data mesh, that's kind of what that's going into. In my mind, it's a subcomponent of the data fabric, a component, because it enables the self-service piece of this. And there are all kinds of complicated aspects of that has to be tied to the business objectives, et cetera. But you need that self-service. Almost think of it like within the enterprise, an internal marketplace that people can use to self-serve themselves off the data. And it's only possible if you do the first two, right? The intelligent, the augmented knowledge graph, and then the intelligent automation. You, the, the governance has to be multimodal, mainly because different countries have different regulations. So you've got to be able to do that. So support for that is essential. And then uh, finally, the multi-cloud stuff that I talked about, the portability across all that and so forth. That's, that's all essential. So that constitutes the data fabric you know, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, you know, we've been on this journey for a long time. We've kind of had... Uh, uh, we have a tremendous amount of experience now that we can bring to bear on this, uh, not just in terms of the technology and the data, but also in terms of the people and the process aspects to this. We also spend a lot of time staffing expertise within different domains. So we have a lot of domain experts, so there are industry ex accelerators that are available to do this kind of digital transformation uh, enabled by AI across different industries. So I invite you to, to look through our resources and also come along on our journey with us. Happy to take any questions. That's great. Thank you so much, Indipal. I'll just take that from you. Thank you. Um, right, oh, I was going to say, are there any questions, but there are hands already in the air. If we can just take the one at the back of the room, please, and if you can just start by saying your name and where you're from, please. Sure. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, so I'm Alhamsa Naimi, the CEO of Pometry, and what we do is um, temporal knowledge graphs, which is the idea that you take a knowledge graph and you have the full data lineage for some of the issues that we discussed. Um, I have two questions. The first is dying to know if that basketball team actually won the match. Um, and the second question is, you've been in the industry long enough to see a lot of these things being rebranded, recycled, and coming back again under different concepts. Um, data fabrics, knowledge graphs, contextual intelligence, the likes. What really excites you about tomorrow, and how do you th recommend others to adopt that piece of process? So first question, um, they won that game. So this was the Orlando versus Miami. They were the two teams. So Orlando was the underdog. So they were down 2-0. They, the, they made the change. They played their backup point guard and backup forward. They won the next game. They won the subsequent game. So they squared the series at 2-2, but they lost the last game. Because by that time, the other coach figured it out. You know, he kind of figured out what to do with them. And uh, they were also using the program, you know, so it was, uh, but they were, the, they, were the, they were the harder team. Now, to your point about um, these things coming back, it's true. I'll give you one example that I think is particularly um, a graphic in my mind. When I was a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon University, which was the cradle of AI at that time, you know, this we were talking about the 80s, and uh, there was a, young professor by the name of Jeff Hinton, who used to uh, sit in the computer science department. 
And I would say he was barely tolerated there because the whole movement was around symbolic AI. I mean, my thesis was you know, in that direction with uh, people like Herbert Simon and so forth. Again, fathers of AI. And Jeff was tolerated because Jeff was doing, uh, he did neural networks. And everybody thought this is just some off the wall thing, never going to make it, etc. Jeff kept at it. Two decades later, you know, he is the father of AI now in the sense that these deep learning systems have taken over the, the, everything. And why did that happen? It happened because the hardware caught up to the concept, the proliferation of data caught up to the concept, you know, the, the internet caught up to the concept, and eventually it all started to see fruit. So I think that's one of the things, you know, the, you know there are tremendous ideas that are around and sometimes you just have to wait for the, for the technology and the other enabling factors to, uh, to catch up. I, I think, you know, in terms of your other question as to what uh, excites me the most, we live in a tremendous time. I mean, for myself, you know, I've, I started my own company after leaving IBM Research. That was 20 years too early to do this kind of work, right? And, uh, but it was, there were some very hard learnings for me in the process. I did practically everything wrong. And I never thought that, you know, I thought the moment was then. But the moment, you know, really seems to be now for this kind of work in terms of where it goes. So I think that the, the data piece is uh, tremendously powerful. It's going to be very pervasive. AI is going to be very pervasive. The use of the edge technologies, uh, just because it's going to, enable everybody to, to, to receive uh, the insights and the benefits of this technology is going to be tremendously uh, effective. And uh, longer term, uh, you know, with the work that's going on in quantum computing, which is of course a complete game changer, it'll, it, it's, it's going to be a different world that we, that we go to. Uh, you know, I think that's another really exciting development Biotech is another exciting development with all this stuff around CRISPR and things like that that's happening. So, tremendously exciting times, but also I think, now I'm speaking personally, tremendously important times to actually have people understand the importance and relevance of these things that are going on so that they can actually then help shape the direction. You know, it takes me back to the example uh, uh, early on. Benjamin Franklin in, uh, in the US, one of the things he did was he created, he enabled the creation of libraries in every neighborhood many, many years ago. And the reason he did that is because he felt that that education and knowledge could not be restricted to a particular part of the population. It really had to be widespread and disseminated. So we're in that kind of world again, I think, with the knowledge being you know, driven by things like data, AI, and so forth, and you know, even the biotech stuff that we talked about. And, and I think people just have to become a lot better. They have to be enabled to be more educated, more informed, so that they can be part of shaping the decision. I think that's probably the biggest uh, the thing that excites me the most. I don't think I know how to do anything about it yet, but it does excite me the most. Okay. Okay, that's a really great answer. I hope that answered your question. Um, I just want to go back to one of the slides there, because you're, you're talking here about the opportunity here and then, you know, looking ahead to the future. And one of the slides there, you said that it was process and people that were the most uh, difficult aspects rather than the technology and the data. So how do you address that? Yeah, so the that there are several, you know, the, for people, the biggest aspect is, again, education. And you can't just, let's say if you've got, you know, 20,000 people in an area and they, they don't know this stuff, you can't just say, well, let's replace them with people who do because they've been educated that way. You have to retrain them. You have to enable them to get retrained. So there has to be a major emphasis on, um, on retraining folks. I mean, the way we think about it is even, you know, we, we kind of see that even with what's being taught in the universities and so forth, 
you have students who come out not quite prepared or as prepared. So we've got programs that start out at high school to educate, uh, educate folks, uh, you know, kids, all the way to retraining of um, not just our, our, our general employee population, but also our executives, also our board. So we kind of run all the way, all the way through. That's an, it's just, it's a continuously learning process and you have to enable and facilitate that. You've got to be wholeheartedly committed to that. And then that also flows into the process piece because the people who are working that process have to be familiar and you know, they, they have to be facile with the change that we are asking them to do. So the name of the game is you, know, you have to be a change agent. In fact, my boss says my job, he describes it as change agent. He doesn't say data officer or anything else. He says change agent. But that's really what you're doing because the people and process piece is that important. Okay, um, okay we'll take one more question. If we just take the, bring the microphone down to the front, please. Uh, by the way, if anyone does have any extra questions, if you go to the event app, then you can uh, connect with Indepal and you can ask any questions direct because we can't address all of them now, unfortunately. If you just state your name, where you're from. Yeah, Enrique Hernandez from Mexico. Uh, I'm from a health tech company that works for breast cancer screening using AI. So I wonder, what were the learnings from IBM working with medical imaging? And if you could tell us, what would you do differently now? Because there are many approaches to this problem, early detection and using AI to empower the few radiologists we have. So can you talk about that? Uh, uh, what you would do differently from? Yeah, in uh, medical image processing, using AI, using like the tools from IBM. I know that Watson have done some tests in the past. So wondering about medical imaging. Oh, medical systems? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I think there's, you know, tremendous uh, future in, uh, AI is going to be essential for every aspect of uh, the healthcare system. I mean, even from, at least I'll speak from the US perspective because I understand that the best. Right from all the administrative, uh, you know, pieces of work that need to be done in the healthcare system, all the way to the, to the diagnostics, drug discovery, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, there's, a, there's, there's a role for AI in every aspect of that. The reason I say that is one way to think about what AI does is if you have an, an area where there is human judgment to be exercised, the job of the AI system is to get more relevant information to that decision maker. You know, by way of, of course, presented as options and so forth, more, not, more naturally than the typical types of, hey, here's the answer. But the argument with the, with the options, like what was considered, what wasn't considered, etc., And you will improve the judgment. You will actually improve the judgment, you will make it quicker. Mainly because there's so much data and information that is surrounding that human decision maker that they are unable to keep up with it. Whether it be you know, a doctor, whether it be a nurse, whether it be an administrator looking at claims, it's just impossible, right? So almost any, the same with, uh, with the drug discovery aspects, there are all kinds of work that's going on in that area where you can impact, uh, where you can impact, uh, you can speed it up, right? You can make it much faster, more, more accurate. There's even one company that does just total AI AI-based small molecule discovery. And you'll see more and more of those examples. So I think it's critical in that space. Okay. Okay, look, the, the applications for AI are very exciting and I'm sure it's gonna um, impact every aspect of our life. Um, I'd love to talk to you more about it right now, but we're out of time, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Indipal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.